evening. It's great to see you here tonight. And this is lecture number three. And it's uh, wonderful to continue to study the Old Testament. As you've probably gathered from the first two lectures, we are flying through the Old Testament. I wish we had more time to delve into it. I can only encourage you once again to take your Bibles at least page through uh, the books of, of the Old Testament. It normally takes you at least two-thirds of a year. If you're on a, on a year reading plan, it will take you about two-thirds of a year to read just through the Old Testament. Uh, that's about three, four, sometimes even five chapters a day. Uh, we're not doing that over here because we only have eight weeks to cover the Old Testament. So my purpose is to give you a proper introduction to the Old Testament, the background, the setting, and then to put every book in historical context so that when you do read through the Old Testament at some stage, that you will have a better grasp of the Old Testament and, and the books may actually speak to you better um, than it would without the background. So as we start tonight, I want to share with you from First Kings, which is the first book that we are going to look at in our study tonight. And um, what I want to share with you by way of a very brief devotion uh, from the life of Solomon in a certain sense, tells a story that will repeat itself throughout the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles. It's a story of, you want to put it in brief, starting well, finishing very badly. And uh, that's the story of Solomon, uh, which is extremely unfortunate because when you read the story, there, there's so much that, that really captures your, your imagination and can can help you understand your relationship with God. Solomon, uh, this is the amazing grace of God, was the son of Bathsheba, the very lady with whom David um, committed adultery. The first baby born out of that relationship uh, died. But then Solomon was born, and David had other wives as well, and therefore also other sons, and they were all half-brothers. And so everyone sort of clamored for the, the attention and for the position. But somewhere, somehow, David made a promise to Bathsheba to say to her, Solomon will be the king that follows uh, in my footsteps. And so that is exactly what happened. You need to read the first couple of chapters of uh, First Kings, and that gives you the background, and we don't have time to go into that. But Solomon uh, rises to power. He's been appointed and um, then chapter 3 introduces a bit of an introduction or gives us a bit of an overview uh, of the life of Solomon. When you read through Kings and Chronicles, um, saying that up front now when we get into the lecture time, you will see that we're going to fly over the rest of the kings. Uh, but as you read through Samuel and Kings, there's quite a bit of attention given to David as we have seen last time. But now when you get to Solomon, uh, there are fewer chapters and as you go through the rest, they are literally summarized. Oftentimes, in a few verses, maybe a chapter, maybe a couple of chapters. But Solomon is one of those where we still have a fairly extensive description uh, of his reign. So in 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. Um, I want to stop right here. This is not part of the devotion. It's part of the lecture time. In fact, I want, want you to hold on to this concept. Because for Solomon, who was a brilliant man, as we know from history and from the Bible's uh, rec record, uh, Solomon was also a brilliant politician. And what he did in terms of marrying uh, foreign wives was actually making a covenant or going into covenant or an agreement with all of these foreign people, in this particular case with Egypt. And Egypt was no small little country that you can simply just subject. In fact, Israel themselves was only a, a very small little nation compared to what happened in the rest of the world. Egypt, Egypt was a major world power at that particular time. And so Solomon, by marrying the daughter actually went into some kind of an agreement, which then meant uh, you don't necessarily go and attack your, uh, your daughter in another country sort of thing. So there's some kind of an alliance or uh, an allegiance that happens through this particular arrangement. And unfortunately, this was not the only one, as we will pick up uh, in just a moment. But he brought her to the city of David until he finished building uh, 
his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Uh, just little bits of information that I want to highlight it immediately. Uh, a wall around Jerusalem. Uh, we'll look at some walls uh, later on in the plural because there's not one single wall around Jerusalem. And even till today, they can't necessarily find the exact perimeter of every single wall that was built around Jerusalem. And as the city grew, the walls were extended and uh, to include some of the suburbs which eventually uh, were built outside of the city walls and then someone came and built another wall uh, around that. But um, there was a wall even before David took the city. But it may be that Solomon actually built a larger wall, a, a bigger wall around the city at this particular stage. We also read that he uh, was responsible for fortifying several other cities. Not every city or town in the old days, in the ancient days, had a wall around it. Many of them were just villages with no protection whatsoever. But the moment you thought that a city was, was important enough or of enough strategic value, then you would fortify that city because that meant that your, your um, reign is, is sort of safe. And so that's part of the background that you need to read uh, over here. The people, however, were still sacrificing, sacrificing at high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Another bit of information or background here. Um, a little bit of, of confusion. Did they sacrifice to other gods? The impression is it, it, they didn't. Although, up to this point in time, if you go back to Judges and, uh, and even Samuel, you will find that there were definite times when Israel... Um, sort of played with other gods and worshipped other gods as well. And this is not the last time that you will read something like this in the books of Kings and uh, Chronicles. And then Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Once again, we're not told to whom he burned or offered these sacrifices. Was it initially to other gods? We know eventually, I will point that out in a moment, he did. But at this point, it's not sure whether he just burned incense to Yahweh, the, the true God, the, the God of Israel, or whether it included any other foreign gods, we, we're not sure. Another interesting comment over here, which you now begin to see as a pattern, is the comparison with your father David, his father David. Now, in his case, it was actually his father David. But from that point on, it doesn't matter who it was, uh, nine, ten generations later, the reference is still to his father David. Not meaning his direct father, but obviously an ancestor of that particular king. And, and David became the king with whom everybody else uh, was compared. Um, because David was the man who walked after God's heart. And it is in the line of David eventually that we believe the son of David, Jesus, came uh, to be the Messiah. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And in this particular case, it's, it sounds like from the context that he definitely burned incense and offered sacrifices to God, the God of Israel, to Yahweh. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord, and I told you before, that L-O-R-D, capital letters, that is Yahweh. And so he, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give to you. We then know the rest of the story uh, in the dream. And this is a kind of a, a strange thing for me. Uh, had, did Solomon have control over what he said because he was dreaming? Uh, or was he actually sort of half awake? In, in other words, he actually had a genuine request from his heart, and that is, Lord, uh, you offer me anything. It's like a genie type thing. I mean, what, what would you ask? Uh, most people would ask for wealth and, and health and, and all sorts of different things. But Solomon, in the dream, asked for wisdom. Wisdom to govern the people. And God said to him, and, and most of us know the story very well, God said to him, because you asked for wisdom, I will give it to you. But I will also add to that wealth. Um, and so Solomon became the wisest and the most wealthy uh, king uh, maybe ever. And uh, interestingly enough, at the, at sort of at the end of that particular section in verse 15, then Solomon awoke and he realized that he, it had been a dream. So 
seems like it was all a dream, but that it became a reality. And as he thought about what happened in his dream, that became his request. And so he owned, in a certain sense, the dream that he had during the previous night. And uh, he returned to Jerusalem. And then we know the story how he became very wise, made some very wise rulings. Uh, the, the very well-known story of how he wanted to, to divide a, a baby because two mothers uh, fought over whose baby it was, uh, that sort of thing. He wanted to cut it in half. Uh, and the true mother said, no, please don't. Just give it to the other woman, rather. Uh, so his wisdom became uh, world-renowned. He became literally known around the world to the point where Sheba came and, and visited uh, and so on. There's still a tradition, by the way, in the country of Ethiopia that Solomon visited Ethiopia till today. I mean, they, they tell it for a fact. They don't, even, they don't even tell you this is just a legend or anything. This is factual for them. Uh, that Solomon came to Ethiopia and had a child with, uh, Beth, uh, with, um, with the king of Sheba. And uh, the queen of, of Sheba, rather. And, um, yeah, um, with the queen of Sheba. And that that particular son was the ruler of Ethiopia, Molelech, or uh, some name like Molelech, or some name like that. I forget the exact name of that particular king. And they still they have a statue in, uh, in Addis Ababa. They show you this is uh, a statue of, of our king, which dates back to the time of Solomon. As I said to you, that I, I wouldn't buy the story, but they believe it's true. Chapter 6, Solomon then builds the temple, after which he builds, uh, he brings the ark to the temple. Uh, his prayer is a wonderful, wonderful uh, prayer where he shows a great insight into his relationship with God in chapter 8, when the, the ark is brought into the temple and the, the temple is dedicated. Um, in chapter 10, the visit of Queen Sheba, his splendor, his... Um, her whole management and everything is explained to us in chapter 10. And then chapter 11 is the last chapter that mentions uh, the reign of Solomon. And I want to flip over to that very briefly. And it says this, um, and compare this with chapter 1 uh, as you read through, sorry, chapter 3, as, as you read through chapter 3. And in chapter 11 it says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of his father David had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. And what I said to you earlier on, this really becomes the sad reality and the story that will repeat itself again and again. There are some wonderful highlights and uh, we can call them revivals, especially uh, in the southern kingdom. Uh, but in the northern kingdom, this pattern uh, repeats itself over and over again. And uh, ultimately, both the northern and the southern kingdoms were destroyed as a result of this particular behavior on the part of some of the kings. I, I, I have difficulty, on the one hand, understanding why a man like Solomon would do that. I, I really have difficulty. But whereas this whole thing is described for us in maybe seven chapters from chapter 3 to 11, seven, eight chapters, uh, it's maybe just a brief peek into his life. One's got to understand he reigned, ruled for 40 years, and over time his heart grew cold. And that's a real danger. This is my devotional thought. There's a real danger. There's a danger for me. And there's a danger for every single one of us. Is that we may start well. We may have good intentions. We, ha we may have the dream experience of chapter 3. But we may end up with hearts cold towards God. And there's a, uh, there's a danger. And these things have been written up for us so that we can learn from that. And so that we can work on our devotion uh, to the Lord. But let's pray together. Our Father, I pray that you would help us to remain faithful to you.
And we do not want to condemn Solomon, but we do want to learn from his mistakes and pray that you would help us as we serve you, that we would serve you wholeheartedly, that we would serve you with passion, and that our passion and our love for you will increase rather than decrease over time. Draw us closer to you even through our study tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we looked at the entrance into the land of Canaan, the settling into the land uh, in the book of Judges. I hope you've had some time to look at the book of Judges, especially the latter part of that book creates a, a picture of just total chaos in the land. It led to the birth of Samuel. Samuel anointed Saul. Saul was replaced by David. And that's where we ended our story at the end of 2 Samuel. And so the story of the entrance into the land, the settling into the land, the vision uh, of the land, and then how the first king came onto the throne, Saul, and replaced by David. And David set the pattern, as I said earlier on. And from that point on, uh, David became the man after God's heart. And he became the model uh, after which God said, this is the kind of man that I want you uh, to be. So we've covered the time frame, about 1230 BC uh, to 700 971 when David died and Solomon took over. Tonight we will look at Kings Chronicles. Um, both of those books are single volumes in the Hebrew canon. And then we're going to continue the story by looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. And we'll go from 971 where we left last time. And we'll take the story up to about 440 uh, BC, which is roughly where the history of the Old Testament or the history as described in the Old Testament, where it ends. From that point on, we are dependent on extra biblical literature to describe the time uh, which we refer to as the intertestamental period. Lots of things happen during that time, but they're not described in the Bible. Even from a prophetic point of view, um, the, the books rather end about 400. The, the difference of opinion among scholars as to exactly when some of the prophets lived, especially uh, uh, Malachi, for example. Uh, but some, some would place him as early as 500 B.C., and others would place him maybe slightly beyond 400 or around 400. Uh, but that is uncertain, and we'll look at that when we get to that particular point in time. I, I would encourage you again to do some additional reading. Uh, we can literally only cover so much in, this, uh, in our time together. So I would encourage you to go to the dictionaries and extra books or even the internet and read up some more uh, about the background of the books that we are doing. So by way of a, a very brief overview uh, of the events that we are going to look at tonight, uh, to remind you of the map, and I have a, a map here of David's kingdom. This is where we left off. And as you can see from this map, uh, Israel... Uh, even modern-day Israel is a, is a rather a tiny little space uh, over there and um, with Syria in the north and so on. But the purple area, the purple shade on that map represents roughly the kingdom that David established because he was able to cross over the Jordan uh, to the south, to the east of Jordan and even push further north into the Hittite Empire and to take quite a bit of land and to rule over that land. And those people pay taxes uh, to David and more specifically to Solomon. Uh, towards the end of Solomon's life, Solomon started losing control over some of those areas. Over the, uh, I call it a mini empire because it was really, it wasn't a massive big empire, but it was an empire nonetheless because they ruled over most of the nations um, in surrounding uh, Judea or Israel at that particular time. God used David to establish this kingdom. His, his rise to power and his death 40 years later introduced a long line of successors. And we're going to very briefly look at them later on. In fact, I'm going to only hit some of the highlights. Uh, as it's a slide that I've also uh, copied and printed for you so that uh, you can have that because it's a picture slide in my presentation. And then when Solomon inherited the country, uh, the kingdom, it was a rather big one and he solidified it. He expanded it even, and um, it was after Solomon and after his death that the kingdom split in two, uh, into a north and a south. And uh, roughly what you see on the screen at the moment in terms of the map, uh, that, is, that is the, the general areas. The north was Israel, uh, 
and the south became known as Judah, and we'll look at that uh, tonight. But after the death of, of, of Solomon, it was divided. The northern kingdom ended when the Assyrians, and they've always been a world power, um, and there were several stages when the Assyrians dominated the world. We, we're talking at this particular stage of the 8th century BC of the new Assyrian Empire, after which they were replaced by the Babylonians. In 612, the Babylonians destroyed the capital city of Nineveh, and the Assyrians never again rose to, pow to, to, to power. But in 722, when they were at the height of their new uh, Assyrian Empire, they came and were, they were pushing down towards Egypt. Uh, remember the story I told you again and again, we have these world uh, um, powers, Egypt in the south, and either Assyria or Babylon or the Greeks or whoever in the north, and they are at, at loggerheads. And so the Assyrians are pushing down south, and in the process they subjected Israel. In fact, they destroyed Samaria, uh, and they took Israel, they took the people into captivity, and they never recovered from that. The southern kingdom, however, mainly because uh, many of the kings continued to serve God, um, several of the kings, kings perhaps I should say, uh, served God. There were also several who did not. But every now and again, just as God threatened to destroy them, a prophet came and there was a revival. And uh, that kept Judah going for much longer until in the meantime, as I said, the Babylonians took over the, the world empire from the Assyrians in about 612. And then they came in, they subjected Jerusalem. They did it at three different times. And they didn't immediately destroy Jerusalem. Uh, but when there was a, a rebellion in about 587-86, they came under Nebuchadnezzar, they besieged the city, and they destroyed uh, the temple, they destroyed Jerusalem, they burned it down, they knocked down the walls, uh, and they left a demolished city behind and took most of the top echelon uh, of the, the nation into captivity. The temple, uh, between 538 uh, and 515 was rebuilt again. Um, the Babylonians, in turn, were overthrown by the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. The Persians became the dominant power, and Cyrus, the king who took over the first king, followed a different philosophy. He allowed all the foreign nations to go home. He didn't necessarily require them to remain in Babylon. And so many of the Jews took the opportunity, not all of them, as we see from the biblical description, but in many of them took the opportunity. They went back. And they started rebuilding the temple. That was delayed. So it took them several uh, years before they eventually completed it. But by 515, the temple was completed and dedicated much smaller than the one that, that uh, Solomon built and not as grandiose as that of Solomon. Um, but it was only many years later, uh, 500 years later roughly, when Herod the Great was appointed by the Romans to uh, rule over the Jews that he wanted to impress the Jews, and he extend, extended and expanded the temple uh, and made it into a rather grand, massive, big place, which is the temple that Jesus found when he was uh, on earth. Uh, that particular temple was destroyed in 70 AD under the Romans uh, when Titus, General Titus came again to siege the city and then destroyed the whole city with temple and, and everything inside of that. So that leads us to um, our study for tonight, the books of 1 and 2 Kings, or 1 and 2 Kings. These books are a continuation of the story that we are told in Samuel. So Samuel starts with Saul, um, with Samuel itself, himself, and then Saul, and then David. And the whole of 2 Samuel is about David and what he did. So about half of the complete volume of Samuel uh, is devoted to David. Uh, you start reading 1 Kings, and the story simply seems to continue. In terms of authorship, um, some people believe it's, it's maybe not one single person who sat down and wrote it all. In fact, we have uh, evidence in Kings and later on also in Chronicles when the story is retold. The same story, told from a different perspective, and they quote other books like the Annals of the Kings, for example. And so they, they quote sources that they have used. Those are lost to us. We have no, rec no uh, uh, evidence anymore. Uh, we, we know that they existed, but we don't have anything uh, that, that, that we can refer to anymore. 
The original sources of these books include the Annals of the Kings, as I said, of Israel and or Judah. And there are references in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 19, for example, uh, and uh, verse 29 to these sources. Um, it says something like, and you'll find that almost again and again, uh, this king reigned and at the end of his reign, uh, he died and he was buried. Um, and everything else that he did was described or is described in the annals of the kings of Judah or the kings of Israel and so on. So there's a lot that they have done that was not actually, that, that, that um, was not described or not taken up into the kings and chronicles books uh, that we have before us. A broad outline of this one single volume called 1 and 2 Kings or 1 and 2 Kings, the death of David and Solomon taking over in uh, chapters 1 and 2 of 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 3 to 11, I've referred to that already, uh, that uh, describes the glory of Solomon's reign uh, with his prayer of wis for wisdom in chapters 3 to 4, the building of the temple essentially in chapters 5 to 8, the fame of Solomon, chapters 9 and 10, and then the fall, or the shame and the death of Solomon. What I did not mention to you earlier on is that chapter 11 also then tells us of some objection uh, and rebe uh, rebellion against the, the rule of Solomon, one of which was a man by the name of Jeroboam. He was not happy with Solomon, uh, but Solomon knew it, and he went after Jeroboam to kill him, and so Jeroboam fled and ended up, I think, in Egypt, if I remember correctly. But that was towards the end of Solomon. So when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became the next king in the line of David. And Rehoboam then had a visit. Jeroboam, who was now in Egypt, came back and he, he had a delegation from the north. Now this, this thing about the north dates back many years. Where it all originated, we don't know. But there, there's a very clear indication of the tension between north and south when David became the king after Saul. You may remember that we talked about David reigning in Hebron for seven years. Now, when you look at a map, Hebron was further south of Jerusalem. And after seven years, and through some scheming, no doubt, and politicking, David eventually won over the people from the north. It meant putting off his own, some of his own people, like his own general and so on, but appointing the general that was general under Saul at the time. But David was clever, and it was a few political shifts and moves, and he was able to consolidate the nation. But it seems like it was a tension that was suppressed and remained just under the surface throughout the life of David, and then Solomon, Solomon's reign, you read the Bible, and, and chapter 10 especially of First Kings, and you'll find an elaborate description of how Solomon ruled and his management and the tables. Queen Sheba came, she was totally taken aback and surprised by even the food that was on the table of Solomon. Now that immediately tells me there was a, there was a wealthy system in place. It needed taxes the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Israelites all needed to pay taxes in order to keep Solomon's kingdom afloat. And so by the end of Solomon, Rehoboam took over and he had a delegation, a visit from the north under the leadership of Jeroboam. And they said, give us some relief. We, we cannot handle this anymore. Rehoboam consulted the wise older men, uh, David's wise men, and they said, give in. But Rehoboam was not happy. He was a young man, so he said, I'm going to check with my buddies. So, and he did check with his friends, and they said, no, man, uh, just, just give it a, a stronger feel. I mean, rule them with an iron fist sort of thing. And uh, when he did give them that news, Jeroboam and the northern tribe said, okay, well, that's it, bye-bye. And Jeroboam then set himself up as king over the north. And from that point on, we're talking about a divided kingdom. And that's the description from 1 Kings chapter 12, where the story is told that I just told you, all the way to 2 Kings chapter 16. And now we have a constantly fluctuation between the two kingdoms. Um, and, and you will read it again and again. Uh, in the year that so-and-so was the king, uh, maybe in the 30th year or 13th year of so-and-so was the king of Israel, 
uh, so-and-so became the king of Judah, and vice versa. And so throughout the books of kings, you will find that particular story, constantly telling of the north and then the south. And then in 2 Kings chapter 17, we read the story of the Assyrians coming in, besieging Samaria, uh, destroying Samaria, and then taking the people into captivity. We are told about five nations or people from, other, from five other nations who were brought in and they were settled in the land. Um, and uh, many people believe, probably wrongly, that that's the origins of the Samaritans. Uh, that's a story for another day. But then we have the decline and the captivity of Judah by Babylon, uh, the, cap the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity uh, by Babylon. And that's described for us in 2 Kings chapter 18, uh, all the way to chapter 25, the end of 2 Kings. And that tells the story of the fall of Jerusalem. In terms of contents of First and Second Kings, the best way that I think we can approach it tonight is not to actually go through it chapter by chapter. We don't have time to do that, but rather to look at uh, the unfolding history of the nation. And then when we get to Chronicles, all I will do is simply highlight the differences between Chronicles and Kings because it's the exact same story that is told. But then from a, from a point of view of Chronicles, the focus is Jerusalem and the temple simply because the chronicler is the name we use for the author of Chronicles, um, probably also was responsible for Ezra and Nehemiah. In other words, we need to fast forward the story almost to 400 years B.C., and the chronicler is now writing the story all the way going back to Abraham, and is trying to summarize it all, and then he focuses on the south, that is the Jude Judean kingdom, and David, and the temple, the destruction thereof, and then the rebuilding of the temple. So that's the line that Chronicles is taking. Um, and therefore, very little attention is given to the northern kingdom in the books of Chronicles. I'm going to do it by looking at every uh, one of the kings initially, and then give you a bit of a, an overview of some of the other kings that followed in the line of Solomon and David. The early years of Solomon we have looked at by way of a, a very brief introduction earlier on. But he established his kingdom by making a few quick and wise moves, such as, and interestingly enough, leading people into like Adonijah was a half-brother of Solomon and he wanted to become king. And Adonijah came with a request and said that he would like to have the Sulamite woman, the lady who was in the old age of David, was a young girl, young lady who was given to David to keep him warm. Uh, very interesting. But... Um, <laughs> Adonijah then came and requested the hand of this Sulamite woman. And Solomon saw right through it. And he thought, this is Adonijah asking to solidify his position because if he can get his foot into the back door, as it were, uh, through the wife of his father David, then he would have more right to the throne. And so Solomon was very clever seeing right through it, and therefore he had him killed. And the same thing happened with Joab. Joab was the general, army general. Uh, but Joab was in support of Adonijah and a few others, even uh, Absalom at the time. And again, uh, Solomon gave him enough rope so that he could hang himself sort of thing. And, but, but essentially, Solomon just killed them off uh, to get rid of them because that's, that's what he needed to do. His prayer for wisdom is well known to us, uh, as I said before. And uh, he became famous for his wealth and his wisdom. His kingdom, in terms of administration, it divided the land into 12 regions. And every region or tribe or whatever you want to call it, every district uh, had a month worth of duty. So the young men uh, needed to get up, go to Jerusalem and serve Solomon and uh, also uh, tax them, heavily tax them to try and keep uh, that kingdom of, kingdom of his going. Trade. Uh, you read about uh, a very interesting trade. He sent out caravans, camel caravans that is, uh, out um, in, in the rest of the world. It, it was well known. Uh, the other day I was reading an article about some discoveries uh, near one of the old gates of the city of Jerusalem where they dug up a coin or some, not even coins, it was uh, descriptions, rough, uh, brief descriptions of some trade predating the conquest of the land. Um, because Jerusalem, as you will know from the map, 
was on the trade route, roughly on the trade route between Egypt and the north. And so Solomon just um, uh, benefited from that. In fact, he became very clever as a middleman. He bought stuff from Egypt or wherever, brought it in, and then sold them off to the north sort of thing. He was a very wise uh, man as far as that is concerned. We even read about apes and all sorts of things that he imported, uh, animals and minerals and so on. In terms of military, he established an impressive army to maintain the empire. Um, if you go to Israel today, you will probably one of the things you'll do is visit Megiddo. It's one of those tells as, that I mentioned to you bef before in another context uh, in the first module. Uh, and they have dug through and at one of the places where you will go, there's several levels that you will visit in Megiddo. But one of the places that you will visit it actually shows the uh, stables for the horses that, that, uh, that probably date from the time of Solomon. Uh, according to the archaeologists at that particular stage. And that was quite far in the north, fur much further north uh, to, uh, than Jerusalem. In terms of building, Solomon used Phoenicians uh, as, a, as a workforce. He built a palace for himself. He built a temple. Many, many other projects as well, including Megiddo, I, I mentioned, uh, Lachish and several others, cities that he fortified. Uh, he had the money, he had the man manpower, he had the wisdom uh, to do all of that. On the screen, you'll find um, or you'll see uh, just a sample of the aqueduct that Solomon built to bring water into Jerusalem because there wasn't enough close by. And um, when you look at this particular picture, you can see how this is, this is solid rock that has been carved out or chiseled out with a tunnel, a hole in the middle, and you can see how they are interlocking. And so eventually this became a long tunnel, and the story is described there. Uh, he built a complex water aqueduct system from Hebron. And uh, if you look at the map again, and uh, remember when you look at a map later on, to actually look at the distance from Hebron. It ran right through, from Hebron, right through Bethlehem, and then all the way up to uh, Jerusalem. And that he did in 950 B.C. The water... Incorporated, he incorporated that as a major design of the temple itself because they needed lots of water. Uh, with all the sacrifices and killing of animals and blood, you can, you can imagine the stench that there would be unless they were able to clean it. So they needed lots of water uh, in the temple in order to, to make the whole thing work. And um, so that's what he did. And this is a 12-kilometer distance where he built this particular aqueduct uh, to bring water into the city. The later years of Solomon, very sadly, uh, he married several foreign women. As I said before, these were political alliances, uh, but these very women brought with them their idol worship. Um, and, and, and for some unknown reason to me, Solomon built them temples for their gods, and they lured him to say, Ah, oh, please, Solomon, if you love me, you'll come to me, uh, with me to my temple. And, and, and Solomon started sacrificing and worshipping some of these other gods, in addition to the marvelous temple that he built in Jerusalem. It blows my mind. I, have, I, I just cannot explain that. But then again, it is a warning for me because we are weak, uh, and so we can easily stumble into the exact same thing. After 40 years of very successful reign, Solomon died in 931. If you read other books uh, or different books in terms of the history of Israel, you will find a difference of a few years. Some people would place Solomon slightly earlier or slightly later, depending on, I, I operate with uh, this particular date, 931. But Solomon's kingdom divided. I've told you that story uh, of Rehoboam and, and then Jeroboam, and it led to the split of the kingdom, and it was never, ever restored during the Old Testament times. The situation is complex and fluid in terms of the movement of Jews. I said that to you last week or last time already, and that is, you see it in the book of Ruth, where people moved to Moab. They happily lived in Moab, married Moabite women, and uh, eventually Ruth came back uh, to Bethlehem as well. Now, how all of that worked, and whenever the tribes on the eastern side moved to the western side of the Jordan, that we are never told. Um, and, and then with the disappearance of the northern kingdom, uh, people were taken literally across the world, um, I mean, the, the known world at the time, and they, they were scattered. Uh, 
Some of those northern tribe people probably, in my estimation, joined the, the southern kingdom. They moved south. And so it's a very complex situation. I don't think you can uh, clearly delineate the tribes and say Judah remained a pure Judean tribe. My personal view is that it became a far more uh, mixed and fluid type situation. Um, but even here, when you have the split of the kingdom north and south, uh, we, we looked at Simeon. Uh, been given an area in the south, right smack bang in the middle of the, 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 the area allocated to Judah. But we then start talking about Judah and Benjamin in the south and the ten tribes in the north. And, and again, I want to say that that I think is an oversimplification um, because I don't think that is exactly how it all panned out or worked out. But in general terms, I think that's all we can say is that the north and the south split. And um, when we look at the northern kingdom described in the books of Kings, we have a bad beginning and a sad ending. Um, whereas Solomon had a very good beginning and a sad ending, uh, Jeroboam started the northern kingdom on very, very shaky grounds. He, Je Jeroboam moved off, established himself as uh, king, um, and then... In his mind, he was saying, well, for the last 40 years or 30-odd years since the building of the temple, even before that, the, the ark was already in Jerusalem. Uh, David brought it in there. So that became the center of worship. Now you have Jerusalem, the capital city. It is growing in stature um, in terms of how people view Jerusalem, which is why even till today, um, Jews are mad about Jerusalem. They, they go crazy. Jerusalem is the place. And so that was what Jeroboam probably encountered. Plus you have the temple, and the temple is now the center of worship. Um, the comment in chapter 3 that people up to that point um, still continue to sacrifice on the high places uh, is a clear indication that the focus was to bring the worship into the temple uh, and into Jerusalem. So Jeroboam was concerned about that. So immediately he set up, he said to the northern tribes, you don't have to go down to Jerusalem anymore. And uh, he built them two shrines. One in the north, uh, so that people don't have to travel too far, and one in the south, uh, close to the border sort of line between Israel and Judah. And from day one, things went wrong, because he, put, he set up there a calf in each of those. And he said to them, does it ring a bell? Does it go back to the desert experience perhaps? So there's something about this cow uh, in the life of Israel. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But he said, and he wasn't necessarily taking them away from Yahweh, but he said, here is, here is your calf. You need to come here. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You need to come and worship here. Because he was afraid that people may align themselves with Jerusalem and the temple and then eventually leave the northern kingdom uh, and, and uh, object to him. On this particular map, you will clearly see Jerusalem uh, right there, Bethlehem, and then Hebron. And you can see how far Solomon had to bring the water in uh, to get it to Jerusalem. But uh, just, just north, literally just north of Jerusalem, you would have the, uh, the border with um, Shechem, which is in red on the map, um, initially as the center of worship, but also initially became the, uh, the place where the king stayed, but ultimately uh, Samaria, um, the area where Samaria was built was, was uh, bought, and I'll point that out in a moment, and that became the capital city uh, of the north. The northern kingdom, representing the majority of the tribes, broke away, and it became known as Israel, and this is extremely confusing, because up to this point in time, we've been talking about Israel. Israel went to Egypt. Israel was led by Moses out of Egypt. Israel spent time in the desert. Israel took the land and Israel settled and so on. Now suddenly in the Bible, Israel refers to the northern kingdom and no longer to all of Israel. And so in a moment I'll tell you some of the names of the south, but Judah essentially was in the south. And although it's not an exact description of the situation, uh, in Joshua, it's, it's common practice to refer to them as the ten tribes, as I said earlier on. But other names that we find in the Bible for the north, um, Ephraim is one of those, uh, and primarily in the prophets, Jacob is another word for 
the northern kingdom. And then more specifically, the word Samaria, which is the capital city. It's like we would refer to Washington or Pretoria or whatever as the capital city of a country. And so Samaria became uh, known or, or representative of the north. Initially, Shechem, as I said, was used as the capital for Israel. But Omri, who was the sixth king of Israel, bought land and established the city of Samaria as the capital of the northern kingdom from about 885, 885 uh, onwards. And um, here is a, a picture of modern Shechem, um, that, that same area. It was destroyed, um, excavated. So some of the places there, including a palace, has been uh, excavated, dating back to the time of the kings uh, of the north. Shaky beginning uh, for Israel, uh, which I have already highlighted. But what I'm going to do now is simply just hit some of the headings in terms of the kings of the north up to the end of the northern kingdom. There was Jeroboam the first. We call him the first because there's another one coming. He led Israel to break away, uh, introduced idol worship, was condemned by God, and he was succeeded by his son Nadab. Baasha murdered Nadab and took over as king. Continuing the evil practices, he was succeeded by his son Elah, who was murdered by Shimri, who in turn committed suicide when the people rejected him. Now, you get the picture here of the north, and, and I can tell you this is essentially how the north continued for a long while. It actually tells you something about the grace of God. Now, here are some of the ruins of Omri's temple. Omri and Ahab, a son of Omri, who then took over, but these have been excavated, not well kept uh, in particular, but uh, it dates back to that time. The next phase, we know actually quite well because of the ministry of um, Elijah and Elisha, the ministries of these two prophets, uh, and they are around the, the, the reign of Ahab. Omri, having been appointed by the people, uh, represented the beginning of the first true dynasty of Israel, he did evil in God's sight. He was succeeded by his son Ahab. Um, and this period was marked by the ministry of several prophets, Elijah and Elisha, as I said before. This is where we read the story of uh, Mount Carmel and the, the battle with the, with the prophets of Baal, etc., etc. So there's, there's quite a, a, a few chapters devoted. Um, and they, they range from the ending of, of First Kings and they go into uh, the book of Second Kings as well. All focused on the north. It's important for you to hold on to this information about the north and the south because when we get to the prophets, they don't follow a chronological, logical uh, layout. And they also don't focus on, on only Judah. Some of them, like Amos, for example, preached to the north. And it seems like almost that God had this very special concern about the north being a very naughty boy, a naughty son, as it were. And so God sent several prophets to go and minister uh, to the north to try and get them back. Uh, on, on the screen you will find a picture of King Jehu of Israel who bows down to Shalmaneser III of Assyria. And the reality is even before the destruction of Samaria, the north was subjected to Assyria as a world power. And they started paying taxes, uh, tributes to that. And here is a picture that you find among the Assyrian um, archaeology digs, and um, they show Jehu bowing down before uh, Shalmaneser, one of the Assyrian kings. But the saga continued. Ahab was succeeded by Ahaziah, then Joram, but la later uh, Joram was killed by Jehu, the one in the picture. From Jehu to Jeroboam the second, uh, Jehu brought about some reforms while the Assyrian armies were beginning to pose a, a major threat. Um, he, he was succeeded by Jehoahaz, followed again by Jehoash. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, there are many names here that we need to try and, and, and get under the belt. And then it was Jeroboam II, and Jeroboam II really brought some reforms. Uh, he was not necessarily that godly, but he was one of the most successful kings of the north. He was once again able to push back the Assyrians and um, in a lull in the Assyrian Empire, was able to expand his kingdom uh, once again. And he was succeeded by his son Zechariah, 
And then Zechariah was murdered by Shalom, introducing a, sh a few short-lived reigns. There was Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah, and Hosea. And by this time, Assyria exercised control, and ultimately they came, besieged Samaria. Um, and when you look at this, the, the picture on the, on the screen here, you'll find the, the, the green sections there representing Assyria, the, the massive empire of Assyria. And you will now see that it goes all the way down to Babylon. And hold that in mind because Babylon eventually rose to power and they moved up to the north. And that is where, that's where Nineveh is right there. Nineveh was destroyed by the Babylonians. And so they just swept around. And as they moved around, the one thing they wanted to do is move to Egypt to, uh, to establish their power. And in that process, they subjected Jerusalem. That's ultimately when we get to the, to the next stage. After a series of battles and a three-year siege of Samaria, Assyria captured the city of Samaria, took most of the important people into uh, exile, and Israel, the northern kingdom, never recovered, leaving much to speculate about. I, I don't know whether you have read anything about this, but uh, you would not believe the stories about that. Um, the Mormon movement in the States believe that they are the lost tribes of Israel, there are people within England, uh, and they have some explanation, giving a kind of a, a Hebrew explanation to even the word British, which is Brit, Brit-ish, or some of the people of the covenant, or something like that. And so British people, there's a view, not, not British people, but there's a view that says that. And then, lo and behold, there are Afrikaners who say they are the lost tribes of Israel. And so God has a special place for uh, for Afrikaners as well. Um, it's all total speculation. Uh, here you have more on the picture, you have more ruins of the city of, of Samaria. The hill of Samaria was in, a, in the tribal territory of Manasseh, but apparently was not significantly inhabited until uh, Omri bought the land, uh, and for the next 160 years the city was the capital of the northern kingdom. Some of the spiritual lessons that we learn from this particular phase, godlessness leads to judgment and fall. God's involvement with His people is evident in His, in His many messages to them. I marvel at the fact that God had so much patience with Him. When you read the story, if you put the story of just Israel together, as I said, it's interspersed with the story of Judah. So you don't always just follow the north. But if you take out the story of the north, like I have done with those kings in a row, it is really astonishing that God lasted so long with them in terms of his patience. Ultimately, he did destroy them because his patience just was over. But uh, it really is God's grace. The fact that he sent so many prophets to speak to them and to try and bring them back. Um, Elijah standing alone uh, in 1 Kings chapter 18 against all of those prophets of Baal uh, on Mount Carmel. And God provided for his prophets in miraculous ways, performed many miracles uh, through them. And that leads us to the southern kingdom, but we're going to take a break uh, before we uh, actually get into the southern kingdom. Okay, let's look at the southern kingdom. Um, and we're now looking at the, the dynasty of David. Some of the names and places as we, as we looked at the northern kingdom, we have a similar situation in the south. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, lost the north uh, to his kingdom and reduced the kingdom to virtually the area of Judah, uh, including perhaps the area that was allocated to Benjamin uh, as well. And uh, that particular area became known as the southern kingdom or Judah or referring to the capital city, and that is uh, Jerusalem. By now, as I said to you before, Jerusalem was well established. It was the political as well as the religious symbol of the nation, and that lasted throughout uh, all the way. In fact, it became the focus, as you see, uh, ultimately, um, and we'll look at that again later on in the book of Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah. Some of the ups and downs, the history of the southern kingdom, or Judah, um, is interwoven and interspersed with that of the north uh, in both Kings and Chronicles, although Chronicles really focus mostly on the southern kingdom and not the north. There are several highlights. I call them revivals. And as you study church history, for example, over the last 2,000 years, you will find that every now and again, and I literally mean every now and again, uh, 
there is a revival. It's not the norm, but it's the, God seems by His grace to bring about a revival. And when you, when you read through the history of the South, that's exactly what you find. You find people on a very slow, slippery, slippery slope, but then there's a revival. Someone comes along and brings the people back uh, to God. Um, and ultimately, the slippery slope ended up with uh, Israel, or with Judah rather, uh, in, in captivity. I believe God, by His grace, allowed um, those kings to bring about the revival, and that meant that Judah was able to last longer than the north. In terms of the history of Judah, uh, Rehoboam started a decline that lasted for about two generations long. He did not serve God. And it, you, you can't blame him because he had a very, very bad example that Solomon left behind uh, towards the end of Solomon's life. But then several kings were responsible for spiritual reform. Uh, most of them uh, followed, however, in the footsteps of Solomon, and that is starting well, finishing badly. Some of them simply even started badly, and they went worse from where they started. But it ultimately led uh, to their downfall. By way of an overview, and I'm not going to do every single king, um, I have printed this out as well on a, on a separate uh, sheet of paper for you to have a look at. But um, the number of kings since Solomon, in other words, Rehoboam would be uh, king number one. The third king after Solomon was Asa. Uh, and they're all in the line of David, by the way, so we don't have to worry about who, what line this is. But he brought about some religious reforms after Rehoboam took the nation down. Uh, again, he ended not so well. Then there was Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat brought about a spiritual revival, which is wonderful to read about. Second Chronicles chapter 17, for example, where he went into battle uh, with, with the enemy, and he prayed about that, fasted and prayed, and the Lord uh, allowed the enemy to be routed by Israel or by Judah at that particular time. Then there is Jehoash, uh, slightly confusing because the names are sometimes repeated in the north and the south, so you need to keep a clear mind on that. Um, Ahaziah was the seventh king. He was murdered by Jehu of Israel. You remember Jehu? And then Ataliah, then the king mother, uh, killed all the, all the, the sons to, to try and leave no one to enter to, to, to get to the throne. What she didn't know that, uh, was that one of the caretakers um, took the little baby Jehoash and took him to the temple. And the temple had many different rooms, some of them set up for storerooms or where the Levites stay or the priests had rooms where they stayed and so on. And, and Jehoash was raised in the temple for the first number of years, six or seven years. Uh, Ataliah, in the meantime, thought she was happily reigning. Uh, she was a very evil woman. And then Jehoash was proclaimed king by the priest at the time. And Jehoash was responsible for a spiritual revival. As long as the high priest, as long as that priest was his mentor and was alive, Jehoash actually served God. After that, he also went uh, downwards. But there was a major revival as a result of his reign. And then there was Uzziah. Uzziah was also known as Azariah. So when you read the Bible, you will find both of those names. And Uzziah uh, is known to us from the book of, of um, Isaiah as well. Chapter 6, Isaiah received his call in the year King Uzziah died. And so that's the Uzziah we're talking about. When you go to Kings and Chronicles, he's primarily referred to as Azariah and not as Uzziah. But again, he brought about reforms uh, military-wise. He, um, he became full of pride and he was struck with leprosy uh, when he started sacrificing in the temple himself, which he wasn't allowed to do. And he then uh, uh, had to use his son as a co-regent while he lived in a separate place as a leprous man. There was Ahaz. This represented one of the low periods, spiritually speaking, for uh, Judah. He was an evil king, and he suffered defeat by enemies. And then there was Hezekiah. Hezekiah brought about reforms once again. He restored the neglected temple. When you read the story, it's, it's an amazing story. Several times under Hezekiah, and then again under Josiah, a little bit later on, you read how the temple needed to be restored. In other words, it gives us the picture that, some, that, that at 
up to that point in time, or for at least several generations, people didn't even look at the temple. They didn't maintain it. The, the temple worship went down the drain. And it was only when a Hezekiah and later on a Josiah came to the throne that they started giving attention to the temple. They, need, they then needed to collect some money in order to restore the temple. And, and the one amazing little bit of truth or information is that under Josiah, they even rediscovered the law. In other words, they lost the law, the book of the law. They didn't read it anymore. And while they were restoring the temple, and the picture is that of, it seems like, rubble and dust and everything else, a total Demokar situation, and somehow someone came upon, happened upon the book of the law, which uh, scholars believe to be that of Deuteronomy, perhaps. But then that was Hezekiah. The amazing thing is that Hezekiah, towards the end of his life, uh, he was announced uh, to die, and uh, he pleaded with God, and God added another 15 years to his life. Uh, but during the last 15 years, his heart also became cold towards God. Didn't go away from God altogether, but he left a legacy. The legacy was Manasseh, and Manasseh was an evil king uh, in Judah. Um, very low point, and, and Manasseh was captured by the Assyrians, and it seems like he had a turn of heart where he started serving God again while he was in captivity. And then there's Josiah. Josiah was one of those young kings like Jehoash. He was only about seven or eight years old when he became the king, um, and he, this was the last of the revivals. But he restored the temple, discovered the book of the law, and this was now one of those typical things where Israel was in the, in the way of a war, literally. Because you had the Babylonians coming from the north, and you had the Egyptians from the south. And Josiah decided to side with the Babylonians. And then he went into war with King Nico, Pharaoh Nico, to try and stop him from, uh, from taking or, or getting into a battle with the Babylonians. And in that particular battle, Josiah lost his life. Uh, when he tried to stop Pharaoh Nico. He was followed by Jehoiakim. There were a few last kings, um, and ultimately Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians. Some of the foreign powers, I've mentioned them several times, so I'm not going to go into detail again, but Assyria dominated from the 7th century, uh, or rather from probably the 9th century, but all the way to the 7th. Nineveh was destroyed in 612, and the Babylonians uh, subjected Egypt in 605. Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians in that particular trip, on that trip, going down to Egypt. They simply just uh, put Jerusalem on its, in its place uh, at the same time. At that time, they already went into the temple. They took some of the temple uh, uh, artifacts and things into captivity. They took several people into captivity with them. There's an interesting story here, a, a sequence to the story, because when Daniel was in captivity, he read about the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied that the captivity will last 70 years. Now, when Jerusalem was destroyed 586, you calculate and you count up all the way down to 538, when the people did uh, or, or were allowed to go home. It doesn't add up to 70 years. So most people, most scholars believe that you need to go back to 605 when the first people were taken into captivity. And from that point on, roughly 70 years later, is when the captivity actually ended. But people like Daniel and others were taken into captivity during this time. The Babylonians came once again, several years later, 597. They came again and they, they took the temple, Jerusalem, subjected them and basically told Jerusalem, sit still and pay your taxes sort of thing. And when there was another rebellion, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar came in 586 and they destroyed uh, the city and the temple and everything with that. This was the final straw. Zedekiah, he was appointed ruler of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, but then Nebuchadnezzar came and after an 18-month siege. You know, these wars lasted longer than we uh, normally think about wars in our day and time. So... I mean, for the, the enemy to live around the city for 18 months, uh, that, that's a long time. In other cases, we talk two years, three years of a siege that they lay. In the meantime, people go hungry inside because there's no way out uh, or, or in. And then these details are confirmed by potsherds that were discovered and uncovered uh, at the city of Lachish. 
and here we have a, a picture of the area of the city of Lakish that has been uncovered. Um, and um, this is a, the, the, the walls there date to the Iron Age, really. But Lakish became a very important city uh, in the life of Judah. And at one stage, the Assyrians took the city or, or, um, and, and then threatened to take Jerusalem as well. And they weren't able to do so, but the Babylonians did. And um, some of these potsherds that were discovered uh, contain letters written by some of the generals at Lachish to the king in Jerusalem. So some correspondence between them. And that confirms some of the details that we have uh, in the Bible in terms of a siege around Lachish and then also the threat to Jerusalem at that particular time. One of the other printouts that I have given you, um, and this has been extremely helpful to me, is to see a list of the kings uh, because it's, it's so confusing when you read through uh, kings and they jump around from north to south and everywhere else. Uh, but this particular picture uh, that I found uh, from Wikimedia is actually very, very helpful because it gives you the genealogy of the kings of ancient Israel uh, and Judah. On the left-hand side, and you will see Jeroboam the first uh, was king, and then his son Nadab. But then you move sideways, and the moment you move sideways, it means that it's not a son of the king that is taken over, but some other person. And so you have Baasha, Baasha's son Elah, and then Zimri and Omri. Omri's son Ahab um, was uh, Ahab uh, was the one that we talked about under or during the time of Elijah and Elisha, and Ahab had a wife called Jezebel. And Jezebel was the one from whom Elijah fled uh, after the incident of the killing of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. But there were two sons, Jehoram and Ahaziah. But Jeroham uh, was killed by Jehu. And Jehu then started a, a dynasty for several kings all the way to the end. And then the, the story goes sideways once again. Uh, to the destruction ultimately of Samaria. So that's the northern kingdom on the left. But on the right hand side you'll find Saul, Ishbosheth, Sheth, which is one of the sons of Saul, um, and then David at the same time. Ishbosheth was initially appointed to be the king over Israel. But at the same time, the south, Judah, appointed David. David ultimately was able to consolidate the whole thing. From that point on, you will find. Solomon and runs through Solomon, Rehoboam, and then um, you can see how the line goes all the way down to Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. And uh, there's another confusion because just the one little letter, M and M and an N, and you have two different kings, Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim uh, as well. That leads us to the books of, of First and Second Chronicles. It retells the story, um, starting with um, a genealogy, going all the way back, um, but we believe, or scholars believe primarily, that in the books of Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, you have one single author, or at least a couple of them who put all of this together, looking at the whole history of primarily Judah, Jerusalem, and the temple, and how it was ultimately restored. So, when we get to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, I'm not going to comment again about the author, because we believe it may be, and probably was, the exact same author as well. Now, when you look at Samuel Kings as a combination, we have one story. Starting with Saul, ending with the fall of Jerusalem. That same story is retold, but now from a different perspective, highlighting especially the line of David and uh, the fact that Jerusalem is the capital city and the temple is the place where people need to worship. When we look at the books of Chronicles, uh, in Hebrew, again, it's one single volume. It was split in two by the, uh, the Greek translation, the LXX or the Septuagint. The title in Hebrew is the words of the days and then Im implying the, the days of the monarchy. So it describes the kings. Um, and the LXX or the Septuagint uh, calls this book, or t the title for that is the things omitted. And the, their belief was when the Bible was translated in or the Old Testament was translated into Greek, uh, their belief was that, um, that Chronicles added some information, which is not exactly true, although uh, Ezra and Nehemiah obviously described the story or the situation beyond uh, the exile. Uh, but apart from that, we find the same story as you find in Samuel and Kings. Uh, 
In our English Bible, the word Chronicles comes from Jerome, uh, who suggested that the book Chronicles is the chronicle of the whole divine story. The chronicler consulted many sources, um, just as Samuel Kings did, uh, but we have geneale genealogical records, letters, official government documents. Uh, several of those things are referred to in the books of Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. There are many differences between the Chronicles and uh, Samuel Kings in the data provided. Um, one of the uh, most interesting examples I actually want to highlight because it really makes for some interesting reading. And uh, you find that in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 24, um, and the exact same story, almost verbatim, with one single little difference. In 2 Samuel 24 verse 1, Again the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. Now, today we take censuses. Uh, somewhere soon, South Africa will have another census, and countries have their censuses that they take. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't see that in a negative light. So, maybe just a word of explanation. The reason why this was wrong is because it led to pride. And so it was saying, uh, look at how big I am. Look at how mighty the nation is. And so it wasn't just counting the nation. I mean, there are other numbers mentioned in the Bible. So that in itself was not wrong. But, but obviously David, David sinned against God because it was pride in his heart that led to uh, this particular uh, incident in his life. But let me just read 2 Samuel 24, 1 again. It says, again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Now, when you flip over to 1 Corinthians, not Corinthians, Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, listen carefully. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So Samuel King says, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel and he incited David. The Lord did. Chronicles has a different perspective. It says the devil uh, stimulated David to take the census. And it just gives you a perspective. Um, and, and that you will find, and this is really literally the only example that I'm going to use, but you can have several of those examples where, where David, for example, his sin with Bathsheba is played down in, in Chronicles, whereas it's told as it is in Samuel Kings. So you, you very clearly have a different perspective in the books of Chronicles, uh, or yeah, in the books of Chronicles. There are four major sections in Chronicles. There's a genealogical prologue in the first uh, nine chapters. It does make for easy, quiet time reading. Uh, you probably just page over and skip them. Um, but there are interesting names there. And then the United Monarchy, mainly focusing on David and Solomon. David is described in 1 Chronicles 10 to 29. Solomon in the first nine chapters of 2 Chronicles. And then you have the history of Judah in 2 Chronicles chapters 10 to 36. And then the exile and the end of the exile is mentioned in the book of Chronicles when Cyrus, King Cyrus, takes over uh, as king of the empire, uh, which now is the Persian Empire. And when you look at that particular outline, uh, you will find it interesting that Israel, the north, is virtually left out, virtually ignored. Not entirely, but when you read through it, you will find them here and there, but the focus is not the north, it is actually the south. And so that leads us to his approach. He was most certainly a theologian and an historian. He selected his materials, he ordered them to suit his purpose, he had a purpose in mind. Uh, he highlighted the covenant of God with Adam, Abraham, Jacob, and David. And that David line is then the one that continues. And he emphasizes the unification of the nation, the unified nation. He's not so much interested in the north and the split, but it's the fact that God is operating through the south, which is by the time he wrote it all, that's reality. The north is no more. Uh, the north fell. Samaria fell 722. He is writing 300 years later. So bear that in mind. And so he doesn't bother with the north because the north is no more. It is actually Judah, Jerusalem, that is important. And it's 
God operating through His servant David. God's covenant was with one nation and the split in the kingdom and even the exile. Um, those things are uh, unfortunate incidents, but God is still working and He's telling the story, continues to tell the story in Ezra and Nehemiah about the restoration of the temple. The chronicler's focus, the fact that David was the one who prepared the way for the building of the temple, that's information that is left out in Samuel and Kings. Samuel Kings tells us that, um, the author there tells us that David had a desire to build the, king, the, the temple. But Chronicles actually has David set it all up. He collects all the material. He has a plan. He then speaks to Solomon. He tells Solomon how the temple needs to be built. And so the chronicler is at pains to point out that David is the one who initiates the temple. It's not Solomon is the one who builds it, but David is the one who really owns it in a certain sense. It, in, it in emphasizes the importance of David and his descendants as God's way of preparing the way for the coming Messiah. In terms of the exile... Not much is known about the conditions that the exiles encountered in Babylon. Uh, most of our knowledge in terms of the Bible comes from reading between the lines. We're simply told in the last chapter of Chronicles how they went into exile um, and in Kings as well. And then you have to pick up the story in Isaiah a little bit in the latter part of Isaiah. Uh, Jeremiah tells us about the fall of Jerusalem and we'll look at that later on. Uh, in our course together, Ezekiel lives in exile. He is a prophet in exile. Daniel lives in exile. The story of Esther is one of exile. So when you read those stories and put a picture together, uh, then it's <clears throat> it's interesting um, that you um, that that you can you can pick up some of the vibe of the people. They were never put in prison. They were never enslaved as such, but they were still not free to actually simply just go home. They were stuck in Babylon, and it was quite a, a long distance away uh, from home. Some of the references in Jeremiah 25, Esther chapter 3, and then Psalm 137. Uh, who knows what, you, what do you find in Psalm 137? There was a very popular song. It was made popular by a secular song group. Rivers of Babylon. Yeah, that's the story. Uh, we, the people, in, our cap, captors ask us to sing them a song. But how can we sing a song when our hearts are broken, essentially? I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, paraphrasing the psalm. By and large, the exiles were not treated as slaves. They were restricted, but ultimately they were given permission to go back home. And many of them didn't go home. Many of them stayed. Daniel, uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah lives, lived uh, probably two generations later, uh, and he was born in captivity, or in captivity, not in prison as such, but he was born in Babylon, and uh, so he didn't know Israel or Judah. Um, and it's interesting, during this time, there seems to be a, uh, a refocusing in terms of where the emphasis should be. And that prepared the way for the coming back and the temple becoming the focus and not the king. Um, there was a desire that grew over time during the intertestamental period for a Messiah. But it seems like the massive desire for uh, a, a king to reign on a throne, that desire has dwindled. It was there, but it didn't, be, it didn't stay in focus uh, so much anymore. We have lots and lots of information about ancient Babylon. Um, this montage uh, that you see on the screen back there, uh, with a lion and a relief there and also some uh, clay, a clay tablet uh, of items from Babylon. It illustrates the greatness of ancient Babyl Babylonia. The winged lion is from the procession street of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Uh, the stele is the top of the code of Hammurabi. And the tablet is the Babylonian, Babylonian chronicle that tells of the capture of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. In other words, the Babylonians went home and wrote up the story of how they took Jerusalem. And that story we have available to us as an extra-biblical proof of the exact same thing that we read of uh, in the Bible itself. The return of some of the exiles decided to remain. Some of, some of the story is told in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah of people coming back, in, uh, not in droves, but in, in different groupings they came back. Um, and then ultimately with Nehemiah as an individual with a whole entourage uh, 
who came back to Jerusalem or came to Jerusalem at the time. Um, some of the exiles were so well settled in Babylon by now that they simply decided to stay there. They didn't know Jerusalem. They didn't know Judah. Um, the reports that they received was the same as Nehemiah. 150 years later, uh, the wall of Jerusalem still wasn't built up. And so why go back home to a place that is dangerous and, and so on while they are fairly comfortable in Babylon? Um, and so obviously you had this difference of those who desired to go back and some people who simply decided to stay on. It takes us to the book of Ezra, uh, the return of the exile under Zerubbabel. What happened between Chronicles and Ezra? Uh, Ezra picks up the story from Second Chronicles. In fact, he repeats the story verbatim because there's an edict given by Cyrus where he, gave, where he gives permission for, according to the Bible, the Jews to go back. We know from extra-biblical literature that, that um, Cyrus gave permission to all the nations. He said, if you want to go back home, uh, you are free to go back home. From a biblical perspective, it's written uh, to emphasize the fact that some of the Jews, some of the um, people of God, took that opportunity to go back. What the Bible does not detail for us is that the Babylonian Empire was overthrown almost without fighting a war. Uh, the Persians simply came, uh, they besieged the city, and overnight they just uh, broke through a wall, and they came in, and, and the Babylonian uh, Empire crumbled under them. That happened in 539. By about 538, he gave permission to people to go back if they wanted to go back to their homelands. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are so closely related the story seems to be intermingled. You read through the book of Nehemiah, for example, and you'll find Ezra on the scene. Ezra, in the middle of the book of, of, of Nehemiah, gets up and he reads from the law, and the people uh, repent of their sins, and they send foreign wives back, and, and, and so on and so on. So th the story seems to be intermingled. So obviously someone is writing the story, uh, and it seems to be one single story. And that is confirmed by the fact that in the Jewish canon, this, the, the two books are actually one, uh, just one, one single book. The chronicler was now simply continuing to relate the next episode in the life of Israel. Chronicles and Kings told us about the fall of Jerusalem, the exile. Now the story is picked up again. So what happened beyond the exile? And uh, this is what Ezra is telling us. So when you go to Ezra, in chapter 1, you will find... Um, the, the story of how several hundreds of people decided to go back home um, and how they were assisted and aided in terms of getting there and how they started rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah tells us the story of the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem, but it fast forwards the story from 538 to 445. So you're talking about 100 years later, and then you have Nehemiah on the scene. But again, as I said to you, the chronicler, the author, is looking back over this whole history and telling the story. Now, the story, in terms of background, relates to the temple in Ezra primarily and the wall of Jerusalem in Nehemiah primarily. But in, in the whole mix, you also have the, uh, the attention given to the spiritual conditions in the land. And again and again, Ezra and Nehemiah reminded the people that it's because of the sins of their forefathers that they are finding themselves in this dilemma that they are. And therefore, read the law, keep the law, and come back to God. So essentially, that is the message. And then the temple and the worship in the temple. Both Ezra and Nehemiah tell us how the temple was rebuilt. The picture that you find on the screen, or that you see on the screen, is that of the so-called Wailing Wall. I need to explain something to you very quickly or briefly. Um, my impression of this particular story is that there is the hill on which the temple was built um, initially, and my picture may not be as, um, uh, as close to the truth, but this temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, and then other people came, and on the rubble over here, they rebuilt the temple, which was a tiny, smaller temple to that of Solomon. And as I said before, not as elaborate, certainly not with the same gold and, and everything else that Solomon was able to build. Now, what I said to you earlier on uh, in this lecture today was when Herod became king 40 years before Christ, uh, 
uh, or 35 years or whatever. He went on a building spree all over the show, including the temple. And what he has done is he has built some retaining walls over there and filled in the whole area, leaving the temple that, that was dedicated in 515. The Jews wouldn't allow him to touch that temple. But he, elab he, he uh, extended the temple area and had elaborate buildings built around that. In 70 AD, when Titus, the Roman general, came and destroyed the temple, he vowed that he wouldn't leave one stone upon another, fulfilling the promise that Jesus made, and that, or the prophecy that Jesus made, that not one stone will be left uh, on one another in the temple, uh, of the temple. That was fulfilled. So my impression is that this wall that has remained, which dates to the time of Herod, is a retaining wall. And what you see on the screen has actually been uncovered because it was halfway covered all the way up. And uh, the Jews excavated that to this particular level. And if you visit Israel and you go and where those people are, are standing, and you can see the size of those stones. I mean, they are, they are enormous. As you go further up, you will find a different layer, different layers, because the, the, the kind of stones and building materials start changing as, they, as you go up uh, f uh, further. But if you go left on that uh, picture, on that screen, uh, you go into a sort of a building area, and on the floor uh, there is a glass area, and if you look down the glass, that wall goes down another three, four, or five meters down. Um, and, and so this was an enormous wall, uh, creating what I, what I believe to be that section where the temple was built. And so I've always kind of wondered, where is this mountain where the temple was built? Well, I think the mountain has been covered, uh, sort of covered up to, to make it level, so you don't necessarily see uh, a particular